Most of you know the name George Harrison. George Harrison was a Beatle. Uh, he died in 2001. He lived in Los Angeles and was an avid gardener. And so some folks in Los Angeles wanted to do something in memory of him, a, a, a memorial for him. So they, at Griffith Park, they planted a pine tree since he was an avid gardener. And they did it uh, again in memorial of him. They put a nice little plaque there. They set it up for him. And uh, about 10 years after that, that tree died. Uh, unfortunately, the tree that they had planted for him died. But here's what's amazing or, or what's interesting about that. The reason the tree died was because it became infested with beetles. <laughs> if only they had just let it be. <laughs> let it be. Yeah. A little, little, bit, little bit ironic, I guess, but it uh, just goes to show you some memorials last, some memorials don't. Uh, and when we look at something like that, we see those everywhere, right, where something's been set up in honor and memory of somebody. And that's the purpose, is to keep the memory of that person alive. A memorial is just that. It's something that is, is set up to keep the memory of someone else alive. And what we are doing today with the Lord's Supper is that. It is a memorial to Jesus Christ, but it does more than keep the memory of Jesus alive. It's a reminder that Jesus is alive. And as we prepare for Easter, we need to be reminded afresh and anew of what that means. The significance of what he did for us in going to the cross, but also the fact that he died, but he is no longer dead. He didn't stay in the tomb. He is alive today. And this memorial represents that and so much more for us. Now, for some of you, you don't understand what this means. And if you don't, then don't worry. It's because someone hasn't explained it to you properly. For some of you, you've done this you may have never done this before. Maybe you are a new Christian and you haven't taken part in this. For some of you, you've done it several times. You know exactly what it means. You know the significance. You know the importance. For some of you here today, you've done it several times and it's just something you do. It is a routine, a religious ritual, and you don't really understand maybe what it means. So the purpose of this, this morning's message, this Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, we want to look at, once again, the meaning of the Lord's Supper. You may think maybe this is kind of a strange sermon for Palm Sunday, but when you think about it, Jesus, uh, the night before he went to the cross, he gathered his disciples together, and they had the first Lord's Supper. He took the Passover feast, and he applied new meaning to it. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at the Lord's Supper, why he did what he did, and he commands us to do it as well, what it means, why we should do it, and why we do it uh, as, as we do. It is something that Jesus commanded us to do. It is a remembrance. Uh, it is something that he uh, instituted with his disciples. We see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke the institution of the Lord's Supper. Again, it's something he commands us to do. And, and we're, we're not taking some new angle on this message this morning. I'm not trying to come up with, with a new creative interpretation of it. We're just looking at the same verses that you've probably seen several times. We're going to look in, in Corinthians. We're going to look at Paul addressing the Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 31. Now again, Jesus instituted this in the Gospels. We see the night before he was crucified, he gathered with his disciples in the other room, in the upper room. He commands us to do it. It's something he tells us to do. But in the Gospels, we see him doing it with his disciples before the cross. All right, in 1 Corinthians 11, where we're going to be today, this, that was written after the cross. This is the Apostle Paul writing the Corinthian church. They were having trouble uh, in a lot of ways, but one of the things they were having trouble with is doing this, the Lord's Supper, for the right reasons. And so he writes them to make sure they understand why they are to do it and what they are to do and what it means also. And so that's exactly what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at Paul's 
letter, his instructions to the Corinthians and look at why we are doing this and what the significance is. We're going to take these verses and we're going to break them up into three big chunks, three, three truths that we're going to learn from Paul to the Corinthians this morning. First is this. This will help us understand why we're doing this this morning. The first is this. At his table, we remember Jesus and his cross. Okay, at the Lord's Supper table, one of the obvious, again, it's a memorial of what he did. One of the obvious things that we are thinking about uh, is that Jesus went to the cross to suffer and die and to pay the price that we could not pay. Look at verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord, Paul says, what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus wants us to remember him and remember something about him. This is the only time in scripture Jesus tells us to do something, to think about him concerning something. All right. And the, 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 uh, the key word here is the word remembrance. And that word remembrance, it means to look back on a past vivid experience, not just to think about it, but to dwell on that past vivid experience. That's the the meaning of the word here, to think about something and to camp out there for a little while. And you think about it. In your life, there are things that you have, experiences in your life, markers, some spiritual markers, other just special events in your life, that when you think on those things, it is a past vivid memory, an experience that you dwell on from time to time. I brought a few things with me this morning that represent past vivid experiences in my life. One of them is my ordination Bible. When I was ordained, I was given this Bible. A couple of reasons, if you see this Bible is in pretty rough shape. I mean, one, it's, again, ordination Bible. Inside is still the bulletin with the order of service for my ordination service. And I think about that, and I think about just as well as my ordination certificate. I think about uh, the call to ministry that God had his plan for my life, but also those that recognized that gift in me and encouraged me uh, to, to be what I am today, to serve the Lord. But also the reason this Bible is in such rough shape is because it was in our house when it was flooded by Hurricane Katrina. And so that too is a past vivid experience. So I can look at this Bible and it reminds me of a few things. Uh, a couple of important things that happened in my life. We were uh, packing up our house in Scottsboro uh, just week before last, uh, getting it ready to close on the house, getting ready to move our stuff over here. And, and, and I think it was in the nightstand, Mandy found her bracelet from when Gracie was born in the hospital. It was in her nightstand. And I look at this, that is a past vivid experience in my life. And that's something that, that I like to dwell on and I like to think about. It. And then I look at her and say, where did this teenager come from? And so that maybe not as, no, that's a good experience too. That's a good thing. But this is a past, represents something in my life. And also I have, this is Norman the turtle, okay? Norman the turtle also went through Katrina, but he's in a little bit better shape. Uh, Norman, the first date that Mandy and I went on, I mean, this is just, this is how we do things. I took her to Build-A-Bear. And, uh, and she built Norman. This was the first thing she, we did. We went, out to, went to the movies, went out to eat. She built Norman. Well, a few years later when we got engaged, I worked with her parents. And the way I proposed, I set up this scavenger hunt that she had to go on. And it led, uh, we went to a couple of different places and it, through her house, she had to follow clues and it led to Norman and Norman's shell, it, it used to be attached, it's not anymore, there's a pocket and the ring was in the pocket. And uh, I know, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was a neat thing, it was fun. But I look at Norman and there's a couple of past vivid memories connected to him. That's why we've hung on to him uh, as long as we have. But we have those markers in our life, right? I mean, we could go around the room 
and you could share with me different things in your life that, that you, when you sit and you think about those things, when you really dwell on those, it's almost like you're there, right? It's almost like you're reliving it all over again. Well, in a sense, that's what Jesus wants us to do with the Lord's Supper. It is... When we remember the Lord's Supper, we do it in remembrance of Him. We are to go and we are to think about what He did on the cross. We are to think about the price, the suffering, His death, His burial. And we are to think about it in such a way that we don't just, we don't just casually, we, we need to, to stop and we dwell on it to the point to where it's almost like we're there. I mean, we think, we look at what Jesus did, the sacrifice that he made with the Lord's Supper. He, he, we think about the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, God the Son, left the glories of heaven to come to earth to die, to take on your sin and my sin on the cross, to, 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 to do what you and I could not do for ourselves. I mean, heaven is perfection is perfect. God is perfect. God cannot allow anything other than perfection into his presence. And you and I, it doesn't matter what we do, how good we are, how many rules we follow, we will never be perfect. But the Lord's Supper reminds us that Jesus is our perfection, that he lived a perfect, sinless life, and he paid the price we could not pay. He became our substitute. He died on the cross so that we could enter into the presence of God for eternity. It reminds us of his sacrifice. It reminds us of the suffering that he endured. It reminds us that God, that Jesus took on the wrath of God himself on the cross. He took on our sin and in doing so took on the wrath that was due us. It reminds us that Jesus for a moment was separated. Perfect fellowship with God the Father was separated from God the Father because he took on our sin. When he cried, my my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was separated from God. The Lord's Supper is a reminder that Jesus endured suffering. He endured punishment. He endured sin as a sinless human being as sinless God. He endured the wrath of God, separation from God, and he did it so that we wouldn't have to. We look back. Jesus, in our busy, crazy lives, this Lord's Supper is a stop sign that he throws up in our lives to say, I want you to stop for just a moment, for just a few minutes, and I want you to think about what I've done for you. I don't want you to just casually Think, I want you to camp out on what this means. Remember the sacrifice that I made for you. I want you to stop everything. And if you're a believer, think about how Jesus has changed your life. Think about the hope that you have. Now, the assurance, that biblical word, hope, it doesn't mean gee, I hope so. It means assurance. Whenever you see that in the Bible, you're talking about assurance that you have. Think about that whatever you're going through in life right now, whether it's good or bad, especially the things that are tough, the things that are difficult, it's only temporary because we know that because of what Jesus did, if I'm a child of God, I have eternity in heaven to look forward to. That, that life is temporary. Pain and suffering will one day be no more because of what Jesus did on the cross because I don't have to suffer eternally for my sins. The hope that we have, the Lord's Supper is a symbolic memorial. It's like the beetle tree, only it lasts. It represents something that's eternal. It's Jesus saying, this is my body. This bread represents my body that I gave for you. He takes the cup and he says, this cup represents my blood that was shed for you. The blood of Jesus covers our sins. In him, meaning Jesus, we have redemption through his blood that is the forgiveness of sin. Ephesians tells us that. We have forgiveness. We have cleansing because of what Jesus did. And and what we are saying this morning, what we are doing is a remembrance. The Lord's Supper, we're not doing a religious performance for God. We are remembering what Jesus performed for us. 
We're not coming here, going through the motions, saying, okay, it's that time of year. You know, Jesus commanded this. He didn't say how often we do it. Some churches do it every week. Some churches do it every month. We do it about once a quarter. I don't do it by a schedule once a quarter because I don't ever want this to become routine. All right, I, don't, I mean, there are certain days of the year that I do it. I like to do it, like Palm Sunday at Christmas. But other times, I want, I want it to be fresh when we do it. This isn't some performance that we're doing for God. This isn't God looking down and seeing, hey, the, the, these, these are good little boys and girls who are going through this ritual, and because they're doing this on a certain day at a certain time, I'm going to put a big old heavenly check mark by their name. Okay? It's not a performance because if it's a performance, basically what that's saying is, is that if I do this, I'm earning a spot in heaven or I'm earning favor with God, which we know is not possible. What this is about is not a performance for God. It's remembering what Jesus performed for us, the sacrifice that he performed. The suffering that he went through, the act of leaving heaven and coming to earth and becoming our substitute on the cross. It's not a performance for God. It is a past vivid experience that we are to think about and we are to dwell on it. We are to let it saturate our minds and saturate our hearts. We are to chew on it for a little while. It is a moment in history that if you are a child of God, it has changed your life forever. A past vivid experience. There's a there are craftsmen in Japan that, that, uh, that, that participate, that do this thing, this art called kitsugi is what it's called. And basically that translates into golden joinery. And what they do is they take broken pieces of, of like pottery and cups and, and dishes and things like that. And instead of throwing them away, they take a lacquer that's mix, mixed with gold or platinum uh, or silver and they join the pieces back together. And it's interesting because the reason they do that is because they want it to highlight the history behind whatever it is that's broken. It's also the philosophy behind it is, is, is taking something broken and making something beautiful out of it. And, and one of the, the artists, one of the guys that does this, he, and this is a picture of one of the cups that they have, they've repaired, what he says is that the gold-filled cracks or represent the history of that item. Now, I think about that and think about, man, there is beauty in history. There's, there are lessons to be learned. And I think about Jesus and the fact that he became, he took on our brokenness. He became broken so that we could be not just restored, but that we could have a brand new life through him. And when I think about the blood-filled cracks of Jesus back, it reminds me of his story, the story of salvation, the story of redemption. And that's what he wants us to do here is to stop. Hey, I know you're busy. I know your, your life is crazy. I know you've got a lot going on and some of it's good, some of it's not. And not judging the good or the bad. I want you to stop everything and just think about for a few moments. Dwell on what I did for you by going to the cross. It's a remembrance. It's a past vivid experience that we think about. It's also a proclamation of the gospel. At the table of Jesus, we proclaim the gospel. We're thinking about what he did and we're remembering. It's an act of remembrance, but we are also preaching a sermon through what we're doing. We are proclaiming the message of salvation, what Jesus did. Why do we do what we do? Well, look at verse 26. Jesus, Paul reminds them what Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That word proclaim, it means to publicly and openly announce and celebrate something. So in a public forum, we are, uh, we are publicly and openly announcing what Jesus did. Well, all that we just talked about that we remembered, that's what we're proclaiming. The, the act of Jesus becoming the sacrifice for our sins. We are celebrating openly. We are celebrating what Jesus did for us. So it is a, it is a proclamation, openly proclaiming the gospel to everybody that's here. The gospel is the good news, and the good news is, is the saving work of Jesus Christ. All this wrapped up again, what we were, are remembering, that's what we're proclaiming. 
We're proclaiming the message of salvation, the good news of salvation, that Jesus has paid the price for sin and that salvation is available through him, through his sacrifice. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're doing a visible sermon. We're partaking of the cup, and by doing so, it represents the blood of Jesus. The bread represents his body that was given. Again, perfect, sinless life, sacrifice for our sins until he comes is notice where it says until he comes now think about this if if you're dead you're not coming back right so we're proclaiming the death of Christ but we're also celebrating the return of Christ through doing this every time we do this we're doing it looking forward to the day that he comes back So we're proclaiming the death of Christ, but we're also announcing and celebrating the fact that he's coming again. Notice it also says, you eat and you drink. Now, unless somebody pins you down and forces food and drink down you, you do that voluntarily, don't you? It's it's something that when you take food and when you take drink, you are voluntarily taking something and placing it inside of you. All right, so by doing this, you eat, you drink by voluntarily coming to the table in remembrance of Christ, taking these elements and putting them inside of us, we are saying that we are in Christ and he is in us. Until he comes, you eat and you drink until, you, until he comes. We are, we are, it is a proclamation that the, of the gospel, what he did, he's coming back, but it's also us stating that we identify with him. That we are in him and that he is in us. We are the body of Christ. When we do this in just a few moments, we're proclaiming the gospel. And and, and we're proclaiming to everybody, everybody in this room, anybody that watches it on video, later, YouTube, whatever, we're proclaiming to everybody that, that what Jesus did, his sacrifice for our sins, that he's coming back again, but also that we are identifying with him. Now, if you are not a child of God, you can't do this in remembrance of him. I mean, think about it. If you, if you haven't accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, then why do this? I mean, really, it's kind of a silly, silly ritual. And let's be honest, the crackers, you know, they don't taste that great, right? I mean, it's, 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 it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to do this. And so this is for those who are followers of Christ. Now, listen, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we don't want to exclude you. We want you to sit back and see this visible sermon unfold. We are sharing with you what Jesus has done for us to change our lives, to save us from sin. It is a visible sermon. We're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're proclaiming his death, his burial, but also his resurrection. And it breaks my heart that there are those who don't know Christ, but I know there are those who don't. But what this tells us, what this tells you, if you're here today and you don't know him, is that if you will call on the name of the Lord like those of us who are saved have, you too can receive salvation. It's a visible sermon. If you you come to Christ, he is yours. This table is yours. And the significance is what he did. There, uh, a pastor that I know... Uh, told a story about a friend of his uh, in Colorado who became the pastor of a church. He followed a longtime pastor, and and he noticed that every time he was doing the Lord's Supper, the people seemed mad at him, and he couldn't figure out why. So he went to one of the longtime members, and he said, Listen, what's going on? I'm getting the sense that the, the church is unhappy with me whenever we do the Lord's Supper. And he said, Well, you're doing it wrong. And the pastor said, well, what do you mean I'm doing it wrong? He said, well, our former pastor, again, longtime pastor, been there 20 or 30 years. He said every time our former pastor would do the Lord's Supper, he would bow his head and he would wave his hands over the the Lord's Supper. Well, the new pastor, the young pastor, he couldn't figure out why in the world would he do this. So he knew the the former pastor. He had talked to him on several occasions, knew him pretty well. He called him up. He had retired. He called him up. He said, listen, I... For the life of me, I can't understand. What, why, why did you do that? What was your reason for doing that? And he said, well, here's the deal. This is Colorado. It gets pretty cold in Colorado. And he said, listen, it would get really cold in that sanctuary. And I was terrified that my hands would get so cold that I would drop the plates. And there was a radiator behind the table, so I would just <laughs> wave my hands to heat them up. But those folks 
had placed spiritual significance to the pastor waving his hands. No. The significance of this table is Jesus, his cross, his death, his burial, and until he comes, his resurrection. We were proclaiming the Lord's death. And as often as you eat and as often as you drink, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is the spiritual significance of the Lord's table. Let me just make it real simple for you. Here's what the Lord's Supper equals the gospel. It is about Jesus who is the Messiah. He, the Messiah, the Son of God, God the Son came to earth. It is a memorial to what he did, his life, his perfect sinless life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And that within that is the message That we are preaching, we are proclaiming the Lord's death, his burial, his resurrection. But it also reminds us of the mission of this church, every church. The mission to go and preach the gospel, to share the gospel. And by proclaiming the Lord's death, we are doing that here. But it's also a reminder that we are to do that outside the walls of this church. It is the mission of every church. Third and final truth. At this table... We examine ourselves and we exalt the Lord. We come to this table, and before we take part, part of the reason I'm revisiting this today is because we need to make sure before we take these elements, we need to examine our hearts to make sure that we are right with God. Look at verse 27, 1 Corinthians 11. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. So a man should examine himself. Now, we're not to examine each other. I'm not examining you. You're not examining me. It's between me and the Lord. I examine my heart. I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to search my heart. We examine ourselves. This is one-on-one between you and the Lord. In this way, he should eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we properly evaluating ourselves, we would not be judged. Now, evidently, there's some people in Corinth who were approaching this in sort of a nonchalant way. Okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to do whatever I want during the week. I'm going to live however I want, but I'm going to come to church on Sunday. I'm going to go through the motions. I'm going to perform these things that I'm supposed to do, and that by doing so, everybody around me will think that I am a faithful Christian. Maybe God will put one of those heavenly check marks by my name. They were just going through the motions. It had become ritual, and they weren't, they weren't coming to the table prepared. And so Paul is saying, listen, if you, if you come to the table, if, if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. He's saying it is impossible to come to this table and not be judged. Either A, I judge myself, or B, God will judge me. And God says, if I judge you, there are going to be consequences. Sickness, death, those were the consequences, evidently, for some of the Corinthians. So judgment's going to take place. So the question is whether or not I'm going to judge myself first and see if, first of all, is my heart clean before the Lord? Is there any unconfessed sin in my life? Is there something that I don't even know about? Lord, show me. Before I come to your table, show me. Is there something that I'm willfully doing? I know there's sin in my life. An action that I've committed, an attitude that I've had, uh, a thought, something I know is displeasing to God. Lord, is there anything in me that, that would hinder my relationship, that would, would, would bring judgment on me for coming to this table? Lord, I want, I want to confess that and I want to get right with you. That's part of what we're supposed to do is to examine our hearts. But you know that word, uh, the Lord's Supper, there's another word for that. It's called communion. And that means sharing with the Lord and sharing with each other. So, Lord, first of all, is my heart clean before you? But second of all, how is my fellowship with you? Am I close to you? Am I walking close to you? Lord, was there ever a time in my life where I was closer to you then than I am now? Is there something keeping me from walking closely to you? Have I drifted from you? Have I, am I not spending enough time in your word? Am I not spending enough time with you, walking in communion with you, in fellowship with you each day? 
but also sharing with the Lord, but sharing with each other. How close am I am to the body of Christ? I mean, think about this. Jesus says he's the head, but we are the body. Jesus isn't some head without a body, and we're not some decapitated corpse. If I'm not close to the body of Christ, I'm not close to Christ himself. So how is my fellowship first with the Lord, but then how is my fellowship with the church? Am I walking in fellowship with him? Is my relationship with God healthy? All of these are things that we, we need to examine. Unconfessed sin in my life. All of these things. And, and here's, here's the question that we ask the Lord. Is my heart clean and is it close to the Lord? How is my fellowship with the Lord? Because in this crazy breakneck speed of life that we all live day to day. We go, we go, we go. Again, the Lord's saying here is a big gigantic stop sign that I'm putting in front of your life. I'm giving you the opportunity to stop, to remember what I did, to proclaim what I did, but also I'm giving you because I, the Lord says, I know your tendency, all of our tendency, you're probably not going to do this if I don't remind you. Here's a reminder just to stop for a few moments and examine your hearts. Are you right with me? Is there any unconfessed sin in my life? Am I walking in right fellowship with you? This is the day that God says stop. But here's the promise. If we do confess, he'll forgive us. Again, a reminder of his forgiveness. We can be restored in our relationship with him. Our fellowship with him can be restored. We can become close to him again. If there's anything between Myself and someone else in the body of Christ is an opportunity to seek restoration and forgiveness and offer forgiveness to become close to his body again, to become close to him. This is the time to stop and say, how is my commitment to Christ? How is my commitment to his church? Am I generous? Am I serving? Am I sending? Am I going? Am I sharing the gospel? Am I being faithful to do what God's called me to do as one of his followers? Not only do we examine ourselves, though, we exalt the Lord. Go back to verse 26. It says, until he comes. Those three little words, those three little words, until he comes, tells us, first of all, again, if you're dead, you're not coming back. It tells us that, that regardless of what's happening in my life, Jesus is coming again. It tells us that, that, that everything in my life, that whatever I, I'm facing, first of all, God is in control. Second of all, until he comes back, one day he's coming back again to receive his church. All those who are dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive will be caught up with them in the air. We, there'll be a great reunion. Jesus is coming back. I have eternity to look forward to. Heaven is my home. We exalt the Lord. We praise the Lord because he's coming back again, because he's in control of my life till he comes. This isn't a cemetery. This is a celebration. I think sometimes we, we camp out a little too much on the memorial part. And listen, we should think about the, the crucifixion of Christ is, is sobering. It is, it is real and it is serious. And we should think about that. But listen, when we pass this out in a few moments, if you smile, it's okay. Because the fact that Jesus is alive and that heaven is my home and I've been forgiven of my sins, that's a reason to be happy. And that's a reason to celebrate the Lord. So there's that balance between the memorial side. This is serious. We need to think about that. We need to dwell on that. There's the balance between the serious and the celebration. Both are appropriate and both are necessary. We examine our hearts. We exalt the Lord. We praise God for what he did. We're serious, but we celebrate. This is a table of love, and this is a table of joy. And this is a table that when you look to Revelation chapter 19, the marriage supper, the marriage feast of the Lamb, this is a preview of that, that one day we will sit in a candlelight dinner with Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our Savior. And I don't know this. I don't know that this is theologically correct, but I'm pretty sure in heaven you can eat all the dessert you want and you won't gain a pound. It's going to be incredible what we have to look forward to. The feast, the fellowship, the worship that we have when we look to heaven, to eternity. Stephen Rummage tells a story about two guys, one by the name of Michael Brady and one by the name of Bill Wool. Michael Brady was a stuntman in and, and, uh, and Hollywood, and a well-known stuntman. And he was going to perform a stunt in Arizona in a movie where he was going to skydive onto the top of a moving train. 
Well, before the stunt, before they shot the stunt, he, Michael Brady, climbed up on top of the train to inspect the rigging. And in just a freak accident, he fell off the train and he was killed instantly. Well, Bill Wall was in a Tucson, Arizona, University Hospital in Tucson on a, an artificial heart, had been on an artificial heart for 59 days. They took the body of Michael Brady to the hospital and they performed a heart transplant. And Bill Wall received a new heart for Michael Brady. The surgery was successful. Six months later, he gets a letter from the family uh, telling him who Michael was and what he had done. And, and, and Bill Wall was amazed to realize that the heart that was now beating inside of him came from a 36-year-old athletic guy who, who loved life and, and uh, was a stuntman. He was amazed. Before the transplant, before he, he had heart uh, failure and needed the transplant. Bill Wall was a type A, overweight, money-driven, money-hungry businessman who really never thought of anybody but himself and, and was, was evident in the fact that his lifestyle contributed to his condition. When he realized, he said that when he realized that the heart that, that he received came from a 36-year-old, fit, athletic, healthy guy who loved life, he realized that he needed to change his life. And he decided from that point forward that he, his life was going to be different. I brought a picture of, of Bill. This is Bill now. Heart transplant. He's an athlete. He, he participates in triathlons, decathlons, cyclists. He's won all kinds of awards. He's set world records. And when he was being interviewed for this magazine, he looked at, pointed towards the medals that he has around his chest, and he said, I think about all of these achievements, and the reason I do what I do is because I want my life to honor the man who gave me his heart. He met the family of his donor, Michael Brady, his dad, his mother, his brother Chris, and they talked about how uh, Michael loved life and that he loved the Lord and that that he, was, he helped people and, and all these things. But his, his, his brother, Chris, asked to do something strange. He brought a stethoscope with him. And he said, listen, I just want to connect with my brother one more time. Can I listen to your heartbeat? And he did. He listened to it. This man received a new life, a new heart. And his life was forever changed. Again, now he, he, he doesn't take for granted everything that he, that, that he did before. He, he, he lives to honor the memory of the person that gave him new life. When we look at this and we think about this, those of us who are believers in Christ, we, again, we haven't been restored. We've been given a new life. And some of you here today, you've tried and you've tried and you've tried. You've tried to do the right things. You're here today. You're at church. Maybe you've splashed on religion and you've tried to be good enough. You've tried to follow the rules, but you know down deep in your heart that there is nothing you can do to make yourself good enough. Your heart's still dirty with sin, but what Jesus says is this reminder is I will give you a new heart and this new heart will change your life forever. For those of us who know Jesus, when, when God places his ear to our hearts, does he hear the heartbeat of his son? Does he hear sincere worship and celebration for the sacrifice that Jesus made? Does he hear our excitement in proclaiming the gospel, the saving message of Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, that saved our lives and changed our lives? Does he hear our hearts beating clean and close to the Lord? Our sins are confessed. We're right with God. We're walking in fellowship with him. We are committed to his body, his church. We are serving. We are generous. We're giving. We're going. We're sharing. We're sending. We're participating in the mission that he's given us, the mission that is the remembrance the message of salvation is a reminder of our mission to go and share the gospel. When God listens to our heart, does he hear his son? Does he hear a life that's been changed by the gospel? So the message for us today, before we enter into this time, and we are going to in just a few moments, we're going to participate in this act of the Lord's Supper. 
What's the condition of your heart? Do you know Jesus? If not, you've got an opportunity to see this visual sermon unfold. And in just a few moments, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to the gospel, to accept salvation. If you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you know Jesus, are you prepared to do this in a way that honors him, that remembers him, that celebrates him, his death, his burial, his resurrection? We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. And as we do that, as we pray, I'm going to ask our deacons, if you would, just to go ahead and move down front as I pray. And as we pray, I'm going to ask the rest of us, let's just take a few moments. We're going to spend a moment in prayer. And I want you to just, just take this opportunity to examine where you are. What's the condition of your heart? Do you know Jesus? Are you lost? If you know Jesus, are you right with him? Are you ready to do what we're about to do? Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we thank you for this reminder, this stop sign that you've placed in our busy lives. This opportunity that you've given us to just take a moment and be reminded of what you've done for us. The sacrifice that you made, Jesus, that you left the glories of heaven to take on our sin, to die for us, to pay the price for sin, the punishment, to take on the wrath of God, to be separated from your Father so that we could have salvation. We know that it is our responsibility, and in doing this, we are to proclaim your death, your burial, your resurrection, that this is a visual sermon, that we are proclaiming what you've done for us. It's a reminder of our, of, of our call to take this message to the lost. And Father, we know that in doing this, we identify with you but we also know that as we come to this table, that we are to examine our hearts. And Lord, I, I just I pray that if there's somebody here today who, who doesn't know you, who hasn't received the gift of salvation, that, that maybe even right now as we pray, that they would just call out to you, Father, I don't understand all there is to know about salvation, but I know I'm lost, that I've done things wrong, that I've sinned, and I need forgiveness, that I can never be good enough, earn my way into heaven. But Lord, I know that, that, that you offer forgiveness and I don't understand everything, but I know Jesus that you died for my sins and, and I'm asking you to come into my life and forgive me of my sins. I pray that if there's somebody here today who needs to pray that prayer, that right now they will just call out to you, being assured that if we call on your name, we'll be saved. For those of us who know you, let us examine our, first of all, the cleanliness of our hearts. Are we have we confessed the sin that exists? Is there any unconfessed sin? Are we living in obedience or disobedience? Our relationship to you, are we close to you? Are we walking in fellowship with you? Are we close to your bride, your body, the church? Are we serving and, and participating in the mission and the ministry of your church? Lord, just, just speak to our hearts in this moment. What do we need to do to get right with you? As we enter in this time of remembrance, help us to do it in a way that glorifies your name. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the forgiveness that you've given, for your sacrifice, your death, your burial, and we celebrate the fact that you are alive today and will come and receive us to be with you one day for all of eternity. God, we thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.